you know? And um, so the second thing we want to talk about, that being the last class, is that once uh, that place, that, that those skins have been stretched out and the, the spikes have been driven in and the brass poles have lifted it up, uh, then once that environment is created in the earth, set up in the earth, then individuals from the camp can come and they can come and experience the altar and the sacrifices. Oh, which Leviticus 1 is a great one. Of course, the whole book, but Leviticus chapter 1. I was just, I don't remember why, but I got over into that and it really says a whole lot of this. And, but they want to, uh, but, but the priests set this up not just for themselves, but they want the people to experience the altar, to experience the lamb, to experience their death that took place here at, at the tabernacle, as it were, in Christ. But they need to see that. They need to experience that from the Holy Spirit. They need God to explain himself, not just man. They need God to explain himself. And he will explain himself in terms of the altar. Okay. So the, the thing that's in the priest's heart, if, if they're true priests, is that they are in tune with God. That's what, that's what being a priest is. They're in tune with God. And of course, we're not talking about Catholic priests. We're talking about God's priests. And as such, their heart is his heart. And they're doing this to bring others into things that would not be seen had this tabernacle not been stretched out and stakes driven in and seen in the earth. And a place has been made. And those priests know their purpose, by the way. Those priests know their purpose and they're together in that purpose. And they live for that end. <laughs> um, but we want others to come in and to experience the altar and to experience their own death and to see that and to see the Christ who is the one who it really is his death, but their death in him. And um, so I, there was a, uh, let me see if I can find it. Uh, it's over in John 4. And I'll just use this as not, a, not necessarily a great example, but it is a good example of the minute area that I am trying to bring out about making this place so that others can come. This John, Ch Gospel of John, chapter 4. <clears throat> okay, so I'm going to just, so I can get to the point then, I'm going to skip different verses because we'll be here all night if I if I try to read the whole thing. Uh, let's start with verse 6 and 7. John 4. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied with his journey, sat by the well, and it was about the sixth hour. There cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus saith unto her, Give me to drink. Okay, now verse 10. Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that saith to thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldest have asked of him, and he would have given to thee living waters. Now verse 13. Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again. Talking about the well, Jacob's well. Verse 14 and 15, but whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst, 
but the water that I shall give him shall be in him. The water that I shall be give shall be a well in him, a well of water springing up unto everlasting life. The woman saith unto him, Sir, give me this water that I may thirst not, neither come here to draw. Okay, we're going to read a few more verses here in a second. Jesus is the well. He's sitting there at Jacob's well. <laughs> the historical reality, this is Jacob's well. This is a famous place. Jesus is the living well. Okay? And once that well starts filling us, then out of us shall come rivers of living water. Okay? But it's but the, you see it's not stagnant, nor is it doctrines that flow out of it or teachings. Not 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 church ancient church doctrines or new creation fellowship teachings can't be. It can't be or we're defeating our very purpose for existence and therefore have no more purpose for existence. It can't be just trying to do that. It has to be this living reality that's in him. What's in him. And it flow and because we see this as it is, you know, the, the way as it is, We see it as it is in him, then it flows out of us as life and it starts giving others that. All right, verse um, 28 uh, through 30. The woman then left her water pots and went her way into the city and saith to the, to the men, verse 29, Come see a man who told me all things that ever I did. Is not this the Christ? And then verse 30. Then they went out of the city and came unto him. Okay. She's doing the right thing. A lot of times we learn things and we gain things and then we write books and then we have teachings and stuff. And we say, well, we'll come, come like, Come to my books. <laughs> but she says, come to him. Now, I believe you can come to him in someone's book. I, I know I have, you know. I'm not putting that down, but I'm just saying, if you, you know, if I make it about me and I'm, I'm not bringing people to him, then I'm bringing them to me. But she brought them to him. Okay. And then they came out. To him, it says. All right, now, verse 39 through 42. 39. And many of the Samaritans of that city believed on him for the saying of the woman. Get it? They're not, they, they didn't believe because they had known him or experienced him. They had not been enfolded, if you will. They just heard somebody who had been. And they believed, okay? For the saying of the woman who testified, he told me all things ever I did, verse 40. So when the Samaritans were come unto him, they besought him that he would tarry with them, and he abode there two days. How many of you knew the woman, when he was with the woman at the well, he stayed there two days? Because they were hungry now. Amen. They had really gotten hold of something. He's going, okay. Let's do this. And uh, verse 41 and 42. And many more believed because of his own word. And said unto the woman, Now we believe not because of thy saying, for we have heard him ourselves, and know that this is indeed the Christ, the Savior of the world. Isn't that, isn't that cool? That's so cool. That is so cool. That's, I got goosebumps. That's what I want. That's what we want. We want to bring people not just to salvation, but to this reality so that it can flow down and flow out and they will be brought, they will have others brought to this living well. They'll get the message, but then they'll be brought in. Okay. So, we're, st we're still, <laughs> this really is still the introduction. 
the next phase then is the altar. I mean, after the altar is the labor. So this is where we start tonight. <laughs> the labor. Um, and if you're not familiar with the setup of the tabernacle, uh, and I'm only drawing the, the tent part, uh, there was the um, Holy of Holies with the mercy seat. There was the seven branch candlestick. There was the table of showbread door here, at least the entrance there. And then uh, altar of incense was here. Okay. And then on the outside of that, down here was the altar, the brazen altar, and the labor. And I guess I should have been having this microphone in, but for those of you listening, basically I just drew a picture of the tabernacle to show where the labor is located. Okay, so at the labor, we see, we see, we see what is completed at the altar. Remember, the labor was made out of the mirrors of the women, except they didn't have glass mirrors back then. They had brass, and polished brass is what they did, and they'd shine it up, and you could see your face in it. So the labor is made of brass, and you could look in there, and you look into the water, and you could you'd literally see a reflection. All right, so the labor is where we see what was completed at the altar. We can see stuff at the altar. Do you, you do realize that, don't you? You can see stuff at the altar and it never be completed to you. All right? All right, so talking about the labor, we're going to do step one, step two, and step three. Okay? Step one, the washing and renewing of the mind to the settled dead, the washing and renewing, because that's really two different things, the washing and renewing of the mind. All right, let's start with Ephesians 5. Anybody familiar with Ephesians 5? <clears throat> Good. Ephesians 5, verse 26 and 27. <clears throat> that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. Remember that labor was full of water. By the washing of water by the word that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. This is, and then, well, let's just stop right there. Okay, so the first thing is the water, the water. There's two things there. There's a big, it's like a big mirror, but it's a big bowl, and it's full of water. And the first thing is the water to be able to wash away the blemishes, and he calls it the washing of the water of the word. And what, is, what the word is declaring is Christ. What the word is declaring is this reality that is settled. It is non-negotiable because it is so settled that there's nothing you can do to unsettle it. You can be unsettled. But that's because you're not enfolded in him. You are believing at him. Believing at him. And that's not loving Jesus. I'm sorry. I'm just, you know, that's not loving Jesus. That's, that's you know, loving the Savior. But it's not loving him as he wanted it. And as he wants it here is he's washing us as a bride, as one with him as that which is his. You, do you see that? I mean, that's, that's just huge. And so just to top it off, verse 32, this is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. This is a great mystery right here. Only Moses saw this. And Moses brought it down, what he saw, and they built a shadow instead of a life organism, 
a bride instead of a bride, instead of a living organism. It was just, and with it was rules and regulations, and this is how you do it. And, you know, anybody here, you know, have kind of a bent where you got you to gotta do it here, this is how you do it. And if you don't do it right, then you're doing it wrong, and everything's messed up, and you know, you know. Um, I think maybe quite a few of you the way we're getting some response here. Um, well, you would work well under the law, but <clears throat> this is different. <clears throat> this is not us. See, for example, this place should be an environment. Amen? <clears throat> it shouldn't be a bunch of examples of the truth. It shouldn't be a shadow of the truth. Well. I mean, the sun shined on us, and that's where the shadow came from. It's important. No, it's not important. It is missing the mark. Missing the mark. This is the mark. Christ is the mark. And, and this, this crucified one, that, that his death brought about our death so that he might live in, so that we might live unto God by him, by him. All right, so <clears throat> it washes and renews. So there is this washing, and you take the water, and you're washing your mind, and you're washing your understanding away. You're taking all the dirt and all the junk, which is nothing more. The dirt and junk is the way we think, okay? It's not you got a dirty mind. I mean, you do. But it's not that kind of dirt. Okay, and, the, and so you take the water from the labor, the washing of the word, and you wash, and your mind is, is, is uh, having all that stuff washed out. But there's another part of it, and that is you look into the labor, and you know what the, script, the scripture's gonna say that we're gonna get into in just a minute. You're gonna look into the labor, and you're gonna see Jesus' face. And you're going to be changed into that image. We're not there quite yet. One more scripture. But, but he removes something, our old patterns. And I, I mean, some of us are proud of our mind. You know. I mean, I remember when I was a brand new Christian and, and somebody said, uh, I was talking to this guy about Jesus. And he said, well, they brainwashed you. And I said, my God, I needed my brain washed. It was so messed up. I need, I need it all washed out. I need. And they're going, you're a fanatic. And I said, I'm a big fan. Anyway, <clears throat> I was hard to. <laughs> all right, don't turn there. I'm just going to read to you Titus three five. Titus three five. Not by works of righteousness which we have done. What is that saying? Look up here. It's not by works that we have done. It's him and it's this reality that is settled yeah. quit tr you know because works of righteousness means you're trying to become something acceptable but you are accepted in the yeah. in the beloved accepted in the beloved and he's called the beloved not you in that sense he's the one the father loves and when he hugs him we get hugged because we're his body yeah. you know he goes I just love this nature and everything inside of you and so he hugs the body of Jesus and we get we get to get in on the hugs <laughs> praise God I just I just love all this all right how much all oh, great okay well let me finish this thing. you know for a guy that's preached for a guy that's preached one hour for my since I was 23 this is difficult all right not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. Okay? So there is that which is done away, and there is that which is brought, which is brand new. Our views are done away. And if our views aren't done away, they will conflict with his views. I mean, they do. I know this. I, I have a master's degree in this area. 
All right. So let's just stop with that, and we'll take. That was Titus three five.